All right, it's time to continue our conversation of applications of second order differential equations. Uh, we started talking about uh, simple harmonic oscillation in the previous lecture, and in this one, we are going to add something to the picture. Um, the the uh, applications we were talking about in the last lecture were those that were ideal systems, ideal systems that retained their energy for all time. So these were right pendulums that swung forever, springs that oscillated forever, and, and so on. Um, you know, these kinds of systems in reality are going to face a dissipative force due to factors like friction, air resistance, these sorts of things. Um, electric circuits can't truly have zero resistance. Um, but essentially thinking of it in terms of friction, because it's something we deal with every day, it's easy to, to see and experience, but if you have resistance to motion, essentially in every case, no matter what phenomena, no matter what constants, no matter what laws you're dealing with, there's some sort of term that involves, well, motion sounds a lot like first derivative. Think of speed, velocity, that sort of, sort of thing. So we need a term involving u prime in our model. Um, the model becomes a little bit more complicated. So we have exactly what we did before in the u double prime plus the omega squared u equals zero, but there's this extra term in the middle, this new term that is a damping term. And the presence of this term is going to change what our solutions look like and what they do and what they what uh, what sorts of things they can model. Um, it's a more realistic thing for modeling real life stuff. The lambda here is some uh, constant that's greater than zero. Uh, you know that with the two in front of it, the two is there to make some of the calculations a little bit easier later on. But essentially, the two lambda is going to be created from other physical constants and so on that are acting together, and they could come from very different sorts of scenarios but results in the same differential equation at the end of the day. So we're going to be dealing with this equation now, and it's similar to the last one. It's, it's linear, it's second order, uh, constants for coefficients. Uh, you know, we're still working in terms of, of lambdas and omegas and, and things like that rather than specific numbers, but we can put some specific numbers into place for actual examples that we get into. And we will get into a couple of those examples in the next lecture. Um, here we're just going to develop some of uh, what to expect with these sorts of things. Um, just putting some like real understanding, I guess, into our solutions, right? In chapter five, you were able to write down solutions to these things. Now we're going to see why those solutions make sense. So the characteristic equation, we can use this to approach just like before. It's going to be R squared. Now, if I go back up to the equation here, uh, it's going to be plus 2 lambda r and then plus the omega squared. So plus, plus 2 lambda r and then plus omega squared equals 0. In general, we don't know how to solve this. We don't know if it factors. We don't know anything. But we do have the quadratic equation to give us two roots. So I'm going to use that and we get, well, negative b, the 2 lambda, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's going to be a 4 lambda squared, minus 4 times a is 1 times c is omega squared, <clears throat> all over 2 times a. <clears throat> now, you can do a little bit of simplification here, but it's probably not too hard to see that the, the, the 2 is going to divide into the first thing and give us minus lambda, and the 2 is going to divide into the second thing, turn into a 4 on the way up into the root, and give us here a lambda squared minus omega squared, just like that. Okay, these are our two roots. These are our two roots. And I'm going to write that down here. But there are different cases for this. And it all depends on what the lambda is and what the omega is. How big are they relative to one another? Think about what they represent. The, the omega um, from the last lecture as well related to the f natural frequency of whatever the oscillation was. That means if you set a pendulum into motion, the rate at which it goes back and forth, you know, uh, 
on it on its own devices, if you will, um, if just let to do its thing, that is given by the omega. How fast does that oscillation occur? That's what that omega is representing. The lambda is this new thing, and I want you to think of that as, as some friction, some dissipative term um, or, or constant that represents um, just how, how much of a contribution that has. The higher the lambda is, the more friction is in whatever it is that we're trying to model. So the higher that lambda is in that, uh, <clears throat> in that pendulum example, for example, the pendulum example, for example, yeah, um, would represent, you know, a, a, a rusty, dusty pendulum with a lot of friction that might uh, more quickly die out, that sort of thing, okay? So high lambda means more friction, high omega means oscillating more frequently. Okay, and it's these two things that are gonna fight and whichever's bigger is going to cause a few different cases to happen. We're gonna talk about the case, first of all, where the omega is largest, because I think this is the most natural place to start. If the omega is largest, well, let's look on the next page. So let's think about this. Um, so this says here, this says here, uh, that omega is is larger than the lambda. So let's just remind ourselves what this is. This is the natural frequency. This is uh, coefficient relating to uh, damping. So I, maybe I'll just write damping coefficient is probably the best thing I can do. So I'll rewrite that. Okay, it's not quite accurate to say that because it also had the two in front to get where we are. But in this case, you look back at our solution here, and if the if the um, omega is bigger than the lambda, then for sure, under the root, you have a negative number. You're subtracting uh, the lambda squared minus the omega squared, you're gonna get a negative number if the omega is bigger. So the stuff under the root in this case is negative. And in that case, you get complex roots to the characteristic equation. In that case, the general solution turns out to be this. Okay, we know from before, from our stuff from chapter five and so on, you get an exponential times sine and cos, okay, with a C1 and a C2 in front of it. Um, I wanna note a couple of different things here. The lambda you see is gonna be the real part. Um, so we had here, so we have my, our r was equal to is minus lambda plus or minus the square root of lambda squared minus the omega squared. Um, so our real part is given by the minus lambda that's right here. And our imaginary part, well, I need to remember how this goes. If I have a negative number under a square root, then, so suppose I had a root of minus 16, you wouldn't write um, minus 4i, you would write 4i. You would take the negative of what's under that to write it down. So you would write this, you would write minus lambda plus or minus the square root of the positive version of that, which is swapping the signs on those, times i. Okay, and this here, so this here, that, uh, that root part is going to be the imaginary part. I'm just gonna do this in a different color so it stands out. So this here, this here is the real part. The minus lambda and the imaginary part is given by that right there. Okay, and so based on that, we can write down the solution. That's why we get an, a root of omega squared minus lambda squared here with this ordering with the omega coming first, because we always have to take that negative first whenever we write down the solutions. In any case, that's what we get to, and this isn't using any sort of new knowledge whatsoever. This is just using stuff from, well, a lecture number, whatever it was, a few ago. And uh, we're gonna look at what this, was, uh, think about what this represents, okay? We have oscillation, that's the cos and the sine talking. We already know that a cos and a sine can be represented as a single um, cosine function or trig or basic trig function. 
maybe with a phase shift. So it's just oscillating back and forth. So, um, so that's familiar. But the different thing is that you have an amplitude, the number in front, right, involves C1 and C2 for sure, um, but also this exponential. And it's an exponential with some decay, e to the minus lambda t, whatever that is. So what that does is it's going to take that cosine and sine function, but multiply it by an ever, ever decreasing function so that at every further time t, the amplitude of that trig function is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the amplitude must decrease exponentially over time, and that guarantees that long term, as t goes to infinity, well, that e to the minus lambda t has to squash the other functions to zero. And overall, the multiplication of them, the whole function, goes to zero. This is the case of damped vibration. And it's really, really intuitive. Just think of how, you know, a pendulum works. As it goes back and forth, if you're thinking there's going to be resistance over time, friction or whatever, that is going to decay more and more and more. And, and the swing is going to go, think of pushing a swing. That's a perfect pendulum, right? If I push a swing, it's eventually going to slow down to a stop. And those oscillations will get smaller and smaller and smaller in um, how big they are. So we start out big, but, but they slowly die out, like this sort of thing. Okay? Exponentials times sine and cos. And if you think about it, I said that lambda Lambda represented the, the damping coefficient, how big that is. And the larger that lambda is, the more powerful that negative exponential is going to be in hitting that solution and making sure it dies out even more quickly. So if lambda is relatively high, well, it's going to um, have a more powerful impact on this solution and get it to die down to zero much more quickly. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I think this represents a lot of um, natural motion that has this sort of, uh, um, well, yeah, a damped harmonic behavior. This is how swings work. This is how pendulums work. This is how springs work. Um, and this is all modeled by this differential equation. Okay, but wait, 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 wait. That was one, that was only one case. How could there be other cases? Like if you have something that's oscillating if you push somebody on a swing and like, like what else can possibly happen except for it to come to a slow stop in oscillating? Um, interesting, right? But as a matter of fact, there is another case. So remember that in this case, we had that the um, omega squared was larger than the lambda squared, but that lambda could be larger than the omega. And that's the other situation. That's when the friction is even higher when the when the damping force is even higher and we're going to explore that here it's kind of fascinating but here we have okay we have lambda is greater than omega it's in this situation that the stuff under the root is positive if we're finding our roots um, when we go to find the so this was what was it r equals it was minus lambda plus or minus the square roots of lambda squared minus omega squared. That's what our roots were to the characteristic equation. And we're saying right here that if the lambda is the bigger one, then, well, the stuff under the root has to be positive, and therefore we don't have complex solutions. We never get sines and coses at all. How does that make sense, considering that we're talking about springs and swings and pendulums and all this kind of stuff? It's like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, except it's swings and springs and pendulums, oh my, it's, I don't know. Anyway, um, the characteristic equation, it must have only real roots. Both of those are going to be real numbers. So we get the sum of exponentials. We get this, and we get this. One for the plus case and one for the minus case. Two exponentials. Okay. I want to look a little bit carefully at those exponentials for a moment so we can think of what uh, what's going on in there. But it's probably not too hard to see 
Let's look at the second one first. Lambda was a positive constant, minus lambda is gonna be negative. I'm subtracting something off of it that's square root, which is a positive number. So I'm taking a negative number and I'm making it more negative. This quantity is certainly negative for sure. Let's look at this one, this first one. There's a way to like mathematically be rigorous about this, but I want you to think about this for a second. You're taking minus lambda, uh, which is a negative number, but then you're adding something to it. But let's see why this quantity must also be negative. Imagine if for a second you didn't have this omega squared here. Imagine you didn't have that. So cover this up for a second and think about what we have here. If I have minus lambda plus the square root of lambda squared, that would be minus lambda plus what? Lambda, assuming lambda is positive. That would be the zero case. So the lambda squared, the square root of lambda squared is making up just enough to recover from the minus lambda before, and I end up with zero. So what would happen if instead I took that lambda squared and I subtracted something from it first before I took the square root? If I did that, I wouldn't have as much to recover and the result is still going to be negative, right? The minus lambda has to be bigger than that piece that would have recovered except I took something away from it with the minus omega squared. And you can actually build an inequality and prove this a little bit more rigorously, but this must also be negative. Uh, so yes, uh, both of these things are negative. And if you think of what negative exponentials do, they just die off and there's not much oscillation at all. Oscillation never occurs because the friction's just too high. Um, you can mathematically show this, but if you take a sum of two exponentials like this, you can basically get um, through an equilibrium position at most once approaching some sort of equilibrium of zero afterward. This is what's called overdamped motion, and I want to demonstrate it for you. Right? It might seem, seem counterintuitive to begin with. Same differential equation as the last case, it's just a different case. Remember that pendulum that I said, oh, if the friction's higher, it's gonna to come to a stop even quicker and just die out. And you push it and it starts and it comes to a stop. And you push it even harder and it just comes to a stop. But then you say, well, this is a stupid pendulum. Let me throw this in the, in the closet for a while. You forget about it for 10 years. 50 years, somebody from freaking Antiques Roadshow shows up, finds this, this clock and says, wow, this is a rusty kind of piece of crap, but let's check it out. Take the pendulum on this thing. Now it's like rusted and dusty and old and corroded and all of the stuff because it's been sitting and like oxidizing or whatever the heck, I'm not a chemist. Take the pendulum and, and give it a push. It was bad to begin with. But now it's so, the lambda is so high that when you push it, it just goes and it dies before it gets to the, before it gets to the center. It exponentially decreases. And maybe, maybe if you give it a strong enough initial condition, it goes across the equilibrium once and then dies. Push! And it goes after crossing once. That's what's happening. That's what these solutions look like. And it's really neat. It's really awesome that they're governed by the same differential equation. And the math is what tells us this, even though we already understand this in reality, right? Solutions will look like this, just dying. Or maybe you give it a push in this direction and it goes up initially, but then dies out. You know, it doesn't matter, right? It's going to die out because you have two exponentials and we know what exponentials do if they have negative exponents as t goes to infinity. They all have to go to zero and they certainly never do what sine and cosine functions do and oscillate back and forth. And that literally, that change in behavior was nothing more than um, thinking about, you know, one parameter reaching some sort of threshold and beyond that threshold, suddenly our roots go from being complex to real. And that's the sweet spot. Um, it's actually related to something called bifurcation theory, which you could look up on differential equations uh, if you were interested in it, where suddenly the, the, all the dynamics of the system change suddenly um, with one parameter at some, some specific value.
Okay, so what is that? that? I think that's a really cool conversation. This is one of my favorite things to talk about because I think it's amazing that we can describe um, all of these situations with a single equation. Okay, the last situation is the, the breaking point between the two. Um, when lambda is equal to omega exactly, it is often called uh, critical damping. And essentially, that represents the exact value at which the behavior of the motion changes dramatically. Um, qualitatively, there's still no trig functions or anything like that. You're still going to have exponentials involved. Um, will you? Yeah. Um, so you're going to get uh, solutions that behave in a similar manner to those in case two. But critical damping is important because it's the very specific value where you cross from one sort of situation to the other. Okay, cool talk. L let's keep going. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, forced vibrations. So, um, let's talk about forced vibrations. Actually, you know what? Why don't we do that for the next video? I'm going to talk about forced vibrations in the next video, and I'll leave this here for now because I think this is a good place to stop. But I'll advertise that instead. Forced vibrations are what's going to come next. We're going to talk about what that means to... Um, Take even this second, this, this, um, uh, the situation where we have damped harmonic oscillation or the simple case, the, the simple harmonic oscillator, but when we represent a force acting on that system, that means changing a homogeneous uh, equation into a non-homogeneous equation. That's what's going to bring up, you know, the need for things like undetermined coefficients, variation of parameters, but we can talk about the physical meaning behind what the YH is and what the YP is. And uh, that's pretty cool too. So I hope you'll enjoy, uh, enjoy that conversation and join me soon. Ciao, ciao. And um, I will see you shortly.